Welcome to the Pivot Point Podcast. This season, I'm focused on real-time hot topics in the gender equality and diversity spaces. In this episode, I will break down a current event and hot topic, provide my point of view, what I liked and like, would like to see change, and leave you with some actionable tips to think about and discuss with your organization. I share this information because equality is a candid conversation. It takes bravery and courage, and you do not have to do it alone. At Pivot Point, I believe we are stronger together. I believe that we are one. Let's dig into this week's topic. So this week, I was speaking at a couple of organizations, uh, male-dominated organizations, male-dominated industries, although I would argue, find me a female-dominated industry or company. Uh, Even nonprofits is mostly led by men, even with 70% of the workforce being women. So that's not an excuse, and it's not a way to say that the status quo is okay. That's point number one that I'm going to make today. But what I want to share uh, in my experience with these two organizations wrestling with equality and diversity and inclusion in the workplace and working with managers on how to communicate their priorities around this and how they care about this, which, by the way, is a hard conversation for a lot of managers to have. We, we aren't equipped with the tools to have what I call a candid conversation. And this week we got pretty candid uh, with a couple groups on communication and men as allies topics. And I wanted to share an insight about our propensity for gendered language. We have a hard time taking gender out of our vocabulary. And I learned something from an ally a few weeks ago about the need to to really filter these types of words. And I actually have heard this from a few of my allies in the expert space. Talk about specific words that are gendered, that are not helpful, and they certainly are not inclusive. So I wanted to give you some of those words because I had a gentleman, an ally in training in one of my audiences, that really connected with this message of, I've got some work to do. And that's what I love is when people connect with this message and they think, I have something I can do now about it. I, instead of thinking I am not the diverse person because I happen to be a white male, instead, I can lean into this. I can do something different. I can make a change inside myself that might change with others. So he latched on to this gendered language conversation. And I used a few examples that I learned from my allies recently around words like, Uh, girls, which is highly inappropriate to call a professional woman a girl. Uh, We would very unlikely call men boys at work unless we're referring to a boys club where there's ill behavior going on. Uh, And then also the word guys. And I wrestle, I struggle with this one as someone that uses the word guys quite a bit. Uh, even when referring to groups of women. And I recently learned that this term is not inclusive. And what helped compel me to strike it from my vocabulary, and in turn I call out you all instead, or team instead, or we instead, which are simple fixes. The reason the term guys is non-inclusive is because we would not call a woman by herself a guy. We might refer to a man by himself as a guy. We would refer to mixed groups of men and women as guys, and certainly groups of men as all guys. But would we do that with groups of all women, right? And is that appropriate? Is that inclusive? Does that signal that we're expecting men to be present here? And as a result, I have become acutely aware of my endless saying of the terms guys. And now as it's coming out of my mouth, I strike it from my vocabulary just as it's about to come out. I instead say we, I instead say team, I instead say you all. And and that's the message that this gentleman and one of my audiences this week really connected with. He said, I use the term ma'am a lot. (laughs) I say girls a lot. I say guys a lot when referring to my crew. Maybe I'm not being inclusive with the women that happen to be quite underrepresented in the minority group within my group. So I'm going to stop saying that and I'm going to use some of the words that you taught us. And I'm going to attempt to take gender out of my vocabulary. Now, I use the term attempt because that is no small feat. 
The words men and women are embedded, his and her, they're everywhere. And that leads me to the second kind of point of view I wanted to share with you today and something I challenge you on that I'm also being challenged by is to look at gender as non-binary. You know, it is very much not man versus woman, he versus she. If you've noticed, a lot of people are calling out the pronouns of which they would like to be referred to and owning that and claiming that with their gender. So there's a term called cisgender, which happens to refer to people that identify their gender with their given born sex, okay? So cisgender people have an advantage. They are in the majority group. Uh, They don't have to explain why my gender might be different than my uh, physical appearance. And so This is an important term to understand that not everyone is cisgender. Not everyone, because they look a certain way, identifies with that gender. And I I get it. This is controversial. I I know I've heard all sorts of backlash from a religious perspective and and just a, a discomfort perspective with this. But having been around a lot of non cisgender folks and folks that, you know, quite frankly, I would put somewhere in the middle of the gender spectrum. They're not necessarily identifying masculine qualities or feminine qualities, but somewhere in the middle. And it kind of depends on the day, the situation, uh, which area uh, they're operating in. And so this is a fluid thing. You know, if I think about it as a spectrum, it is a fluidity around gender. And knowing (laughs) the next generation really identifies with this. Uh, We're not going to accept this in the workplace. If you're not talking about this in your workplace, and you're not being open to this gender spectrum and this fluidity and the use of different pronouns, uh, you're behind. Uh, 31% of millennials um, identify uh, outside of, of that, right, on the spectrum. They would put themselves somewhere different than what maybe we would traditionally categorize if we were work, looking at this binary. Uh, and even more of the next generation uh, to come up that's just during the workforce. So consider that, consider that as a compelling reason to reframe how you look at gender, the gendered language you use, maybe some of these words that you could strike from your vocabulary or replace with more inclusive words. It takes time. You know, one other example of a language change I'm making is the term partner when referring to my husband. That is much more inclusive than saying husband, uh, or if you're a man, saying wife. And the reason for that is, is we place an assumption that you are in kind of a quote unquote traditional gender partnership with the opposite sex, the opposite gender. And that certainly signals to others when they talk about their wife, if it is a same sex relationship, my wife or husband, um, you know, that kind of singles them out. That puts them in a position to have to be uncomfortable rather than the term partner, which hey, and I kind of like that. I'd much rather have a partner (laughs) than a spouse. Uh, Sounds like property. A partner's in it with you together, kind of like an ally is. And so I have called my husband, my husband for six years. (laughs) So calling him partner is not an easy thing to do. And that's something I'm reframing that I'm working on. Uh, And as the words slip out of my mouth, I correct myself and say that. So I challenge you this week, to have this conversation with somebody you work with, someone maybe you have a good place of trust where you can talk about the tough stuff. If you're a manager, open up the door to your team. Ask them what they think. Hey, I listened to this podcast. I heard this thing about gendered language. Do you think we do that here? Here's my take. Here's something I'm working on. And see how that just opens the door to a candid conversation about something that's traditionally not talked about at work, but people want to be their full selves at work. They want to talk about these issues. If you're not talking talking about them, they're talking about them somewhere else, and they're probably not bringing their full best selves to work, and you're probably not getting the best out of your people if you're not having these types of conversations. So I encourage you uh, to bring this hot topic to your team. Share something you're working on, a point of view you have with it. Uh, Take some of these actionable tips, these reframing of our language of those gendered uh, terms, as well as looking at it as a spectrum instead of a binary male versus female world. So that's what I'll leave you with today. And as always, share this. If you got something out of this message, share it with somebody you know, share it with people you work with, share it on social media. And uh, we look forward to 
hearing from you and also learning with you next week on next week's hot topic. Did you know that you can find all three seasons of our 40 plus episodes at nextpivotpoint.com? You can sign up for our next free online workshop, get access to our five questions to get the gender equality conversation started in your organization, and ask me, Julie, your questions directly. I appreciate you listening to this episode. Who do you know that needs to hear this message? Hit the share button, connect with me on Instagram at nextpivotpoint, and I post daily on LinkedIn. Simply search search Julie Kratz, K-R-A-T-Z, and you can find me there. I host this podcast because I believe we are stronger together, that we are truly one.